this was about 1957 when I went back to uh, to uh, Detroit. I think I was uh, I was just uh, 19 years old. I was the youngest guy they'd ever hired in there, and uh, I got to work with Earl and got to work with Mitchell on the Stingray Corvette, what became the Stingray. I worked on the the car that was the prototype they called the Stingray Racer, and uh, it was great working with Bill Mitchell because uh, he was like the epitome of of, of the, the great designers of that era, and uh, and I kept trying to tell Mr. Mitchell, you know, I, I think the nose should be a little ho lower and the tail end should be a little higher, and I think this is what we should do. The line says, "Look, kid," he says, "I designed the Corvettes around here." Just do what I tell you, okay? <laughs> so we built the car like he wanted. And, I mean, today it's considered an icon of design. The Stingray Corvette's one of the greatest looking cars ever. But the nose is too high and the tail is too low. <laughs> and consequently, you run that thing at about 140 and the front wheels come off the ground. So uh, those are all, again, all the lessons that I learned that uh, I applied to this car. Carol said, I want to go to Europe, and how are we going to go faster and the guys already getting as much horsepower out of the uh, 289 engines we were running the Cobra Roadsters and I tried to explain to Carol I said well the, the car has got too much drag to, to go any faster we've either got to reduce the drag or we've got to go up by the horsepower and I said um, if you double the speed the uh, the drag goes up by the square and if you want to double that with horsepower, you got to go up by the cube. And there's no way we're going to cube the horsepower. And unless we change the body completely, uh, there's no hope with the, with the Roadster either. But I said, this is the way to do it. So I, I sort of drew up a, a rough outline of what the car would look like. And I told him, I said, you know, this car is going to be a very different looking automobile. And Carol didn't seem to care about what the car looked like. All he wanted to know is, he says, is it going to be faster? And I said, I don't know, but I think the guys that came up with these ideas were a lot smarter than anybody else around. And these were the Germans from 1939. There was a whole group of them, uh, a guy named uh, Erwin Komenda at Porsche, and a guy named Koenig von Faschenfeld, Germany, and Dr. Wunderbald Kamm. They were all the leaders in advanced aerodynamics in the late 30s when nobody else even knew anything about this. And they had written some papers and built prototypes and of course all of that stuff was destroyed in uh, World War II so very little information was left on it but slowly slowly I dug some of it out in the library at, at, at GM there were a, a series of uh, just mimeograph sheets that had somehow uh, the Allies after the war had gone through Germany for all the technical data they could find and if it was something about automobiles, well, they copied it all down and they sent it to every automobile company. And that's where I found out the, uh, the, the secret to the German aerodynamic designs. Even though I couldn't read the German, I could understand the, uh, the numbers and the results that they got with the ideas. And uh, again, as I say, Carol really didn't care. He just says, is, is it going to work? And I said, I think so. But I showed it to the guys in the shop, and nobody wanted to work on it. It was so ugly, they thought that uh, they didn't want to have any part of it. They just won the uh, three uh, championships in 1963 with the Cobra Roadsters. They were a pretty proud group, and they just didn't want to spend any time working on anything that looked like a losing proposition. Mm -hmm. It was a guy from New Zealand named John Olson who had just come over to work in the shop, didn't want to go back to England in the winter and uh, hired on so he was kind of an outsider and uh, Phil Remington said well I'll give you John you can work with him and then Ken Miles who was the, one of the best race drivers in Southern California believed in the idea he convinced Carol that we should go ahead and uh, and try the idea out because he'd built a couple of specials of his own and uh, so let's let's try the idea so Basically, Ken Miles, John, and myself were the three of us uh, that worked on this car to begin with. The prototype of this automobile was built in 90 days from the first sketch to the time we raced it. So it was really, really a pretty crude piece of equipment. Uh, but again, having the best fabricating guys in the company, and they all sort of began to come in and, and help out and work on it. 
and uh, we took it out to Riverside the first time. It was February 1st, 1964, I remember the date, and uh, went out there. Not everybody went out there, because a lot of people didn't care about it. They thought, well, a car's gonna be heavier than the, than the Roadster, it's not gonna be any faster, and, and anything that ugly isn't gonna be that quick anyway. So, so we had the believers and the non-believers, and uh, we went out to Riverside Raceway, and uh, Ken Miles really didn't run very many laps in the car. Um, he was so Im impressed with the car, he went out first, came back in, and he said, you know, what gear we got in this thing? And of course, we'd had the same gear we ran on the Roadster, and because we wanted to make a direct comparison on it. And the car was so much faster out of the corners because the chassis was stiffer, and it was so much faster down the back straight that we went from um, top speed of about 165 mile an hour with the Roadsters up to about 185. So that right then we knew that we would be comparatively in, in speed with the Ferraris of that date. And we hadn't touched the car. I mean, this was right out of the box. And there were, there were all kinds of compromises that we'd had to make on the car. I would had been very concerned that we were gonna have some lift at the back end at that speed. And I had tried to convince uh, Phil Remington, our chief engineer, that we should, I designed a movable wing on the back end of the car. And this was before the era of, of movable aerodynamics had been banned on race cars. And he said, I looked at it, he said, God, he said, that'll take us three or four days to build. And uh, we just haven't got time to do that. So let's run the car without it and uh, and see how it runs. And, and, you know, he was saying, well, you guys go out there and fall on your face and then we don't have to put any extra work in on it. So anyway, the car was really, really fast. And um, so I got back to the shop and then everybody's cheering about it. And, and uh, it became the, the focus of our attention. Carol got the group of guys together and said, okay, we're gonna go to Daytona with this car. And I said, good, now we can get the wing built on it. No, 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 we don't have time to do that. We're gonna run it just the way it is. It's already fast enough. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. So we went to Daytona and uh, the car was so fast right out of the box down there. Uh, and there was no concern on the lift because we were running on the high banking there and right. the G-forces had keep, uh, keep it in on the banking. And uh, Bob Holder, Holbert, who had never driven the car, uh, got in the car and went out and he was he would just said i can go buy the ferraris like you know i'm not even peaked out in red line yet hmm. so uh ken miles who'd been made the team manager for that event said okay we'll back the rpm down about uh oh 700 rpm so keep the rpms down now we're going slower but we're at the same speed of the ferraris so we made our fuel consumption tests on that point and we were 25 percent better fuel efficiency so we said, okay, we've got it made now because we can run the 2000 Ks and we won't have to come in and refuel and we're equally at speed at the Ferrari. So we'll just pass them on the number of pit stops. We'll, we have to stop right. less. Mm -hmm. And if we have any problem, all we have to do is turn the RPM up and you know take them at the end. So that was the strategy for it. Unfortunately, we had a fire in the pits. We were way, way out in the lead, all seven, seven laps out in the lead. And uh, so we had to park the car because uh, it had burned up the back mm -hmm. end. So we didn't get to run it again until uh, Sebring. And at that point, uh, the car won its first race. Uh, and then Ford saw how fast the car was going. And that was the point where Ford Motor came in and came in and decided to give us some help and decided that they would back us for a program to go to Europe. So at that point, uh, we decided that we would build six of these coupes, and uh, the only car that we had finished was the prototype. And by that time, there's only 12 guys in the shop. I mean, this is really a minimal, minimal uh, effort. We went over to Europe, but that meant that most of the guys had to go to Europe, uh, and they went down to the Targa Florio to run. And this car went to Le Mans uh, with John Olson, and. Uh, he was sitting there just, you know, waiting for the crew to come up from the Targa Florio because there was nobody else that could run the car. And the big, big difference at that time was that Ford Motor Company had just come out with the GT40. And this was gonna be the trickest automobile ever built. I mean, they'd spent millions of dollars in this car and there was a huge amount of publicity on it. 
because they were introducing it at the same weekend that we were going to run at Le Mans. So we didn't have a driver, so the car is parked in the pits, and it's kind of cold and rainy and not very, very nice day. So the first guy that goes out in the in the GT40 was the top German, uh, excuse me, the top French driver, uh, Joe Schlesser, and the car was aerodynamically unstable, so the GT40 crashed, and uh, fortunately uh, Joe wasn't hurt and uh, got out of the car, and so he's kind of dejected and walking around the pits and comes across John Olson. Of course, they knew each other a bit from racing. Said, why aren't you testing this car? And he said, well, all the guys are down at the Targa Florio and until Carol gets up here. I just have to, you know, wait for him. He said, well, I'd like to drive the car. So they, John says, well, I can't let you drive it, but we'll, we'll set you up the car. So they adjusted the seats for him, got all the belts set up for him, and then Carol came in the next day in a Carol had a lot of respect for, for Joe already, and he said, okay, none of our guys are here because Gurney was down there, Jerry Grant, um, all of our drivers were down to Targa Florio, and they hadn't come up. So we put Joe Schlesser in the car, and I say, it's still raining and kind of grim, and so we said, let's hold off a bit. They're going to run the, the second GT40. Uh, so they had Roy Salvadori in it, and Roy was the guy that co-drove uh, with Carroll Shelby to win 1959 in the Aston Martin at, at Le Mans. So a very respected top driver. So he gets in the second GT40 and goes out, and it's aerodynamically unstable, crashes it, destroys the car. So in two days, Ford's written off both their cars, and uh, Joe Schlesser gets in this thing and goes out and smokes them all. <laughs> sets the GT lap record and is running almost as fast as the prototypes. So right then we knew we were looking pretty good. and We hadn't even really got the car dialed in yet. Yeah. I was about 22 years old at this point. So, uh, and, you know, again, I'm just the kid working with these great, great guys like Phil Remington. What an opportunity. So they... They were the success of this car. They made it. The ideas were all there, and uh, but uh, without that talent, it never would have got built. And I owe them a lot. I mean, this is the last era where race cars were designed by the collective experience of the guys on the shop floor. You could come in with the idea but uh, it was their their ability to take an idea and and build it without a full set of drawings you know i mean you, i couldn't have done it at gm because they would have required a full set of engineering drawings there would have been a committee to study it they would have called in uh, aerodynamic experts who would have said it wouldn't have worked so th there was no way that it could have gotten done except the way that we did it and uh, that was really the uh, the great, great part of it is just to be able to work with all of these guys and to use their collective experience to build a car and then have it all work.